go ahead and get started. Um, welcome everyone. Those of you who don't know me, I'm Ellen, obviously, and I am the co-chair of the Plant Breeding and Genetic Circle. So welcome back for the first uh, Plant Breeding and Genetic Circle of the fall semester. And uh, just a few announcements that I need to make before I turn it over to our speaker. So we are moving back to in-person meetings beginning next week. We'll be meeting both in HEAP room 103, which is a venue change from previous in-person semesters, and on Zoom. So you're welcome to join either way and bring your lunch if you like to eat. Because of the room change from previous in-person meetings, we're also having to change the time. So we'll be starting at 12.30 and going from 12.30 to 1.30 beginning next week. And I'll send out emails, of course, reminding you of that change. And then since I am not on campus, Catherine Danmiago Clement has graciously agreed to join as the Plant Breeding Circle co-chair so that she can handle all of the in-person meeting parts. So she'll be handling all of that. I'll continue to handle the scheduling in Zoom and we'll work together on that. She um, did say she was having some internet issues. I'm not 100% sure if she made it back on, the, on today's meeting, but um, she's been doing a great job working with me and she is a PhD student in um, the cotton program doing genomics and some other things. I don't have her credentials in front of me or explain a little bit more. But um, lastly, before I turn it over, Dr. Hendricks has agreed to be here until two after the meeting for some more informal conversations on Zoom or to answer questions or whatever. So I do encourage you to stick around if you're interested in those conversations. I'm sure this will be a great presentation and conversation as well. And um, we're excited to have him. And I will now turn it over to Z to introduce our speaker. Thanks. Thank you, Alan. My name is Z. And it is my honor to host and introduce our first speaker of the semester, Dr. Bill Hendricks. Dr. Hendricks received his BS in agronomy and PhD in molecular biology and plant physiology from the University of Arkansas. Then he worked in research and development for Monsanto, currently Bayer, for the past 15 years. Now he is based in Germany, working in the product development sectors for ag biotics. He started his career in the cotton breeding division in Mississippi and have found his way to California as a principal scientist on a project aimed to develop and utilize RNAi technology and herbicide applications. He and his colleagues have spent eight years enabling this technology, and today he will be sharing his insight and discoveries from this key research project. So let us welcome him and uh, show us uh, approval with a friendly thumbs up in the Zoom. And uh, I'll yield the floor to Dr. Hendricks. Dr. Hendricks, please. Okay, thank you for that introduction, Z. Um, just a little bit more detail on the, the introduction, just to, mainly for context about the, the topic for today, which is topical RNAi in plants and the, and the work that we did at Monsanto at the time, but now Bayer. Um, so, as a company, as, as, as a Monsanto company, the earliest work on this was in 2010, something like that. Really ramped up in 2011, that's when I joined the project. And we spent eight years or more really focused effort trying to develop this technology. And I won't go into the product concepts too much, but we tried all sorts of different product concepts, but the ones that really floated to the top and it was mostly based on value is herbicides, so RNA-based herbicides, of course, insect control and virus control. And then we had a bee health type of uh, project. But today I'll talk mostly about the, the work in plants and then specifically on the work around uh, RNA-based herbicides. But where I wanted to start with all of that is the basics. And you'll get one slide on each of these sort of basics, but the key in understanding is about this time frame. I spent a long time I'm giving you a one side summary, but there are a lot of folks that, uh, and, you know, brain power and uh, time and effort that went into really, really develop these kind of the, the key points that I pulled out. So as we're going through this, uh, if you have questions, please, I don't mind if you stop me. Uh, I'm certain there's more detail than I, than I was able to, to, um, to get in these slides, but I really wanted to hit the high points and kind of frame up topical RNAi 
what are the challenges and, and what did Monsanto slash Baird do to, to overcome those challenges? So starting off with barriers. So the, what are the barriers to topical RNA? Um, I think this is, uh, I mean, if you just read my slide really quick, you'll say, okay, this is like a no brainer. This is easy, right? And this is all the, all the things you might think of, of what can stop a small molecule uh, from getting in from the leaf surface as an agricultural spray into a cell to do its thing. So I think it's obvious as I'm presenting it, but it was not obvious, I mean, in terms of early in the project. And this was, it was really appreciation of these plant barriers and breaking them down systematically that ultimately led to success in terms of delivery um, of, of, top, of double strand RNA. I think the key factor is the size and the charge of, of um, um, RNA molecules. So our 20 tumor, you're gonna hear, let me use my pointer here really quick. Um, 20 tumor or 22 nucleotide double strand RNA or 22 nucleotide SI RNA. So I have a couple different, I tried to get my nomenclature um, consistent, but anyway, I'm talking about the same molecule. It's very large by small molecule standards. So molecular weight of 14,000 plus or minus, depending on base composition, highly charged. And it's this size, the physical size and the charge that really limits us at every major um, barrier from the exterior to the interior to, to a living cell where, where RNAi would you know, be going on. This picture on the left is some of the, this is early work, this is uh, confocal microscopy, but early formulations were using a simple superspreading surfactant and double strand RNA. And we were seeing a phenotype, um, later discovered that was not RNAi. Uh, it was something else, maybe a plant defense response. Really, it was un unclear what exactly it was, but it was all related to trying to reverse resistance uh, to glyphosate and uh, glyphosate-resistant Palmer amaranth. So this is this whole story started right there with glyphosate resistance in Palmer, and trying to, as a company, asking the question, "What can we do about that?" And the main hypothesis was, "Okay, we know it's high copy. We have, you know, high expression of EPSPS." That's what's driving the resistance. So let's just silence the gene. And that was the uh, uh, kind of basic initial hypotheses. And the formulations that were used uh, are what's shown on the, on the left here. RNA is labeled in red. It's a super spreading surfactant with a labeled RNA. The RNA does exactly what you would expect it to do. It spreads over the leaf and then does nothing else. It's very large, highly charged. There's nothing in that formulation that would enable uptake to get through the cuticle, cell wall size exclusion. I, I want, uh, maybe if you, if you could somehow get through the cuticle, you could probably diffuse through. In fact, we have data to show that you can for that size. Plasma membrane, et cetera, down the line. There's nothing in that formulation that um, promotes transfection. So the RNA acted just like we would expect. It's just on the surface doing nothing essentially, or most of it's doing nothing. So in terms of the barriers, I don't want to belabor this point too much, but the cuticle of course is waxy, size and charge are a major obstacle. Cell wall size exclusion was one that's um, probably, it's unique to plants and it's important in that your cell wall is essentially a molecular sieve. So you have cell wall size exclusion limits. So if any of you have done gel filtration chromatography with the beads, and the size exclusion, the cell wall is just like that. So it's something that has to be accounted for in your, both in the size of your double strand RNA and more importantly, the size of your transfection reagent. So um, I would say 2012, 2013, something like that. Uh, small team, myself and a small team uh, had an objective to describe or understand cell wall size exclusion limit uh, for double strand RNAs. So using a number of different systems, we used um, cell cultures, so BY2 cells and tobacco cell cultures, and also isolated plant cell walls packed into a filtration column. So it's, you know, these were cleaned up and didn't look so different from, you know, a Cephidex column. And we measured what the size exclusion of, of the cell wall was. And what we found was that the 20 tumor, you can diffuse through, and then of course, as you increase size, uh, we looked at 50 base pairs, 100 base pairs, and then larger. But once you get up to 100 base pair double strand RNA, 
that's right at the upper size limit in those two systems we were using. So starting off, you need to be less than 100. But the idea of the transfection reagent, that adds size as well. And you know all the vaccines that we're taking now for COVID are using lipid nanoparticles. Those are very large. So from the literature, we know that the cell wall size exclusion limit is around 10 nanometers in, in diameter. Those transfection reagents, the lipid nanoparticles, those are 100 nanometers, could be larger. Sometimes they're polydispersed, so you have smaller and larger sizes, but very, very large, far too large to go through the cell wall. So if you were to get through the cuticle, can't get through the cell wall with something like that. Easy for me to say now, uh, Monsanto, we collaborated with all, several large pharmaceutical companies, screened all of their lipid libraries to try to find a lipid combination that would enable scrayable double-strand RNA. None of them worked. Uh, many of them fell apart on the waxy cuticle surface. Um, didn't do a lot of characterization, but the conclusion was we did not come out of any of those collaborations with a transfection reagent that worked for us. Um, um, the other two barriers, plasma membrane, that's where transfection reagents are really designed to work. So in other systems, cell-based systems, humans, whatever, that's, that's what those things are doing. They're uh, helping the payload get across the plasma membrane. And that's, that's what they're really designed to do. And in fact, those transfection reagents that work great in human cell cultures, they also work in plant protoplast. In fact, some of the commercially available ones like from Invitrogen, for example, the RNAi max, that's like a killer one for protoplast. Very low use rates, very low damage to the cells, beautiful transfection, beautiful gene silencing. It does nothing to all plants. And again, belaboring this point, back to cell wall size exclusion, it's very important. Uh, and the final one is the nucleases. So there's, we spend time studying this as well. So extracellular and intracellular nu nucleases are a barrier to getting intact molecules into the plant. And extracellular in particular, we studied, looks in most of the species we did, uh, mostly bent and tomatoes, so Solanaceae, uh, exonuclease, and I'll introduce you to the 20 tumor in a second, but as single-stranded ends, those single-stranded ends are very important for activity. Those are cleaved off you know, within minutes of uh, infiltration into the apoplast. So there's a, I, I think the point of this slide was to get you thinking of, well, is this even possible, right? And then I think that's the point of view to come at topical double-strand RNA in plants is it's, there's a, uh, it's technically highly difficult and to really achieve that uh, without systematically addressing these, uh, th these barriers, I think uh, we wouldn't have gotten anywhere. Okay, so with all of that, I've spent five minutes convincing you that th it's impossible to do this. We, we were able to achieve delivery to whole plants. So we had two basic methods and, and I use this word breakthrough here and it's, it's talking about the carbon dots. Um, so I'll get into that more, but uh, I think out of all of that work that we did, so let's say nine years plus, the carbon dot delivery methodology is the one thing that I really consider as new science and a breakthrough and that got us close to having a commercially viable sprayable RNAi type of formulation. So um, I encourage you, I have the link to the publication for carbon dots in the end of this public and the end of this presentation. So I encourage you to take a look at that. Um, with that being said, that's the state of the art. Where we started at was simple abrasion. And I'll, I'll show you the most simple way to do abrasion in a second. But what you're looking at on the left there is those are grain amaranth plants. So they're a very close relative of Palmer amaranth. Um, that's what was our workhorse, our model plant for weed control and understanding that glyphosate resistance. Those had been previously sprayed with double-stranded RNA. Uh, super spreading surfactant and an osmolite and a buffer. So uh, not, nothing too, uh, too um, kind of high tech. We let that dry and then we use this abrasion device. So all of this is done in a standard track sprayer. And this is a um, essentially like a sand blaster. So we're using a very fine grit. It was a silicone carbide, uh, 360 uh, grit uh, material. And that's sprayed at a fixed distance, fixed speed, fixed pressure above the plants. And all we're doing is very lightly abrading the surface. So there's that dried RNA on the, on the top of the leaf. And just think back to that picture I showed in the first, first slide, that's essentially what's going on. There's a, 
a uniform coating of RNA on the leaves. We do a light abrasion and that provides delivery and it's, it's robust. Uh, we tried hard to make that agriculturally viable. Uh, didn't get that close. I think it could be done, um, but for laboratory, um, and, th and in this case, this, this, this was our attempt to make it more quantitative uh, in terms of the delivery to each plant. But um, it, was a great, it was a great tool and it, it enabled us to keep going. And, and you know, at the time it's <clears throat> relatively small advance. And of course, leadership give, gave the feedback that yeah, but we can't do that in the field. But the value of this sort of uh, advancement in the project is that it kept the funding going. So that, that was the, the theme. Once we focused on RNAi mode of action and forgot about the other stuff that was going on with Palmer, that's when we started making these incremental steps over time as a group, and really what kept this project going for so long. And you know, there's no product that came came out of the plant part of this. And Monsanto and Bayer spent a lot of money. I mean, at the at its peak, we had more than 100 scientists working on this, and uh, on so many as support staff, and of course leadership. Uh, it was our top line project and reason to believe is what this abrasion did on, on the left. Uh, stomatal flooding is the more state of the art technique. And that comprises three things it is a super spreading surfactant. So, if you know, you probably heard of Silhouette L77 if you've done like um, floral dip and Arabidopsis or read any of the papers. Um, for glyphos anyway, you probably heard of it, but we, we do use that one and it was, or we did use that one and it's, it, it was a good good spreader, but it was sort of phytotoxic, at, especially at higher concentrations. This Breakthrough S279 is another product, a super spreader, much more well tolerated by plants and a more wide variety of plants. Uh, so that was really our, the one that we used um, routinely the last couple of years of the research, but either one works. So you have the super spreading surfactant and you have your RNA complex to a carbon dot. So a carbon dot is a small nanoparticle that does two things. It protects the RNA from those R uh, RNases that I talked about, extracellular <clears throat> and intracellular until it's released from the particle. And also does the plasma membrane transpection. So that's the two functions of our carbon dot. <clears throat> so we, we characterize the size and I'm not, I'm not going to do the carbon dot justice in this presentation. So there's a lot of detail in the, in the publication, but the one that we ended up going with for routine, the size was about uh, just under four nanometers uh, in diameter. So these were developed in-house and we used a branched PEI. So there's a couple ways to make carbon dots. Uh, the, um, you have a carbon core and then a group. So there's two types we report on. One is a one pot synthesis of carbon dot that uses a particular me molecular weight branched PEI both as the carbon core and as the functionalized unit. And uh, we do this one pot synthesis, gel filtration, uh, so size fractionate. And uh, we reported in the paper a particular fraction that works worked the best. And that, that was our material that we used for, uh, we'd make large batches of that <clears throat> and then use it for months at a time, very stable, good transfection reagent. And what we're showing here to the right in the, in the movie is the, um, uh, you can pipette it on. This is on the underside of a grain amber. Actually, I think that's polymer amaranth. <clears throat> on the underside of a polymer amaranth leaf. And the darkening there is our super spreading surfactant driving the material into the stomates. So we're not damaging the leaf there. Uh, and I mean, you can, you can put on too much silhouette or too much osmolite, whatever. But um, this doesn't damage the leaves. This is just simply infiltrating. And if you've ever done syringe infiltration, it's the very same thing but you're using a super spreader to do that. And concentrations of 0.4%, 0.3 in that range is what we would use to do this. You can hand pipette it on if you're short on RNA, or as we got better with uh, internal production, we're spraying this on, you know, over the top carbon dots, they work. You could spray over the top. You don't have to do this, you know, underside delivery. Um, and they work in, um, um, several species, and of course our models, which I'll talk about, benthamiana, tomato, and they did work in uh, grain amaranth as, as well. But the, um, 
Yeah, I think that's all I wanted to say about that slide. So really the carbon dot, that's the breakthrough. And that's the one piece that I'd like to see. You know, part of the idea behind publishing this and talking about this uh, research now is um, other half of the story is Bayer decided to discontinue the project. You know, this is after, it was time and we had spent a lot of time and money on it and still no product, but we were able to publish. And we put, there's five publications from this work, uh, various aspects and the carbon dot paper is the one that, you know, I feel like is the, really the one that I, ho I hope to see people using and working on. And, you know, the one that we talk about, the, that branched PEI and that particular PEI, it's a very specific one. We screened a lot of different PEIs and they all don't work. And it's not, this, it's not a simple relationship either. It's not just smaller, the nanoparticle, the better. There's a certain size and it's right around that three to four nanometers is the ones that work the best. And this is all empirical work using benthamiana as our, uh, and uh, GFP silencing as our readout. Okay, <clears throat> so that's, that's the delivery piece. And that took a long time and it was about incremental progress and reason to believe for leadership. Had another team working on what types of double strand RNA should we be using? You know, once we, once we get delivery down, which ones work the best? And that's what an abrasion enabled for us. It was a low tech method but we could start asking questions like this in whole plants. What types of RNA do we need to have the best efficacy? And again, this is a, a group effort, a lot of folks working on this, spending a lot of time. You know, this is their day job, this is all they do. Tested so many different types of variants of double strand RNA. I don't want to use the word all, but if most of the types you could think of, uh, even like things that are uh, unusual. Uh, like maybe a minimal expression cassette to try to drive production in the plant, that sort of thing. The conclusion from all that work is that the 22 nucleotide uh, double strand RNA, that's what I have pictured here, let me move this out of the way, <clears throat> is the most efficacious uh, molecule type, double strand RNA molecule type against uh, across all the species that we could get topical RNAi to work in. And I'll show you a slide on the next, next uh, or coming up to kind of show the spectrum of this technology, but this is the one. So if you're interested in using carbon dots or abrasion, this is what you should use. Start right here. Right? And you know, it's sure you can do in vitro transcription, longer ones, make them blunt ended. That's great. They don't work very, very, uh, they're not very robust. This is what you should start with is a 20 tumor. And one second here. I think this has a, okay, there it is. I left this detail in just to make one quick point. This is kind of the state of the art and it's like an incremental gain over a standard templated 20 tumor. And by templated, I mean exact match on both strands to your target gene. Uh, we did make modifications and it did work better, but it's, it's kind of nominal. It's not, not that big of an increase. So what we're doing here by putting a GC clamp on one side and leaving this unpaired, and these are un these are non-templated. In other words, those aren't in the target sequence. Leaving the this this side unpaired forces antisense loading into the risk complex, or it favors it. It doesn't necessarily force it. So it did help a little bit, but you know, if you're starting out with this, forget about that. Just make templated 20 tumors, and, and you're in, you're in good shape. So that's one piece. <clears throat> the other piece is they need to have these overhangs. And these are three prime, two nucleotide overhangs. And those are very important. You take this blunt end at a 20 tumor, doesn't work. And I, I say that uh, in whole plants, you see no phenotype, it's not measurable. If you go into protoplast and use very high rates with uh, potent transfection, you can see a little bit of knockdown, but we're talking orders of magnitude less. These overhangs are catalytic and it has to do with loading in the risk, at least according to the, the um, the literature. So this is a known thing from other systems. Um, but from other systems, and this was from our academic consultants, the kind of strict rule around overhangs wasn't there. So they were surprised that with this finding that, you know, blunt ended don't work. Or basic, I mean, for in practical uh, point of view, they don't work. And what we found was that that efficacy was driven by amp uh, amplification. So you go in with a 20 tumor, you either use your abrasion or you use your carbon dots, deliver this 20 tumor to a cell, 
It's loaded into the risk complex, finds its target, slicing event occurs, and then that goes, initiates the RNAi of that gene. So that sliced fragment is recruited by RDR6, presumably. We, we don't have direct data, but just for this discussion, let's just call it RDR6, makes our double strand, and then it's off. You know, your amplification, your amplification is off to the races after that. 20 tumors do this amplification when they do slicing. You take the same sequence and you make it a 21-mer, still with the two nucleotide overhangs, you don't get amplification. And you can get a phenotype still. So you still get the slicing of it with a 21-mer, but the phenotypes are more punctate. And versus what I'll show you in a second is uh, with a 22-mer, they sp it spreads, there's local spread. And sometimes they local spread so much, the whole leaf gets silenced. So this amplification process is you initiated by this 22 tumor is one of the keys to get a, you know, robust phenotypes that you can you visualize and you can measure molecularly. And we'll talk a lot about this secondary amplification. I'll show you data. I'm gonna to have to pick it up here. Um, one other statement here is, did a lot of gene screening looking for herbicidal target genes. Um, approximately 40% of our gene targets picked at random or, you know, not, not at random, that's not true. Genes that we thought would be important for either giving us a marker target, like a marker gene target or herbicidal, only about 40% of those worked, were readily, readily, readily silenced with a 20 tumor. So that's something to keep in mind is there is limitations to this technology. And this is not unheard of in, in the, the plant RNAi, uh, even using transgenes. Some genes are just harder to silence. And, we did not have a way to predict that. It was all done empirically. We didn't know going in. We looked at introns, expression level, um, or presence or absence of introns. Um, but generally, when there's a lot of gene redundancy, those don't silence very well. So lower copies seem to silence a little, have more frequency. But as a rough target, about half of, a, of any given uh, gene set will be silenced using a 20 tumor. Okay, so spectrum. We, um, what I'm showing here is basically almost every plant species we got uh, topical RNAi to work in. So all sorts of dicots and that's not a omission or we're not, we didn't leave anything out. There were no monocots and we, we tried with particularly with corn, we tried to silence using our best methods that worked great in something like canola or grain amaranth or water hemp, didn't work in corn. And, the success in dicots sort of deprioritized that work in corn. Not to say that it wasn't worked on, it was. There were teams working on it uh, that we just didn't have success. And we tried uh, other types of monocots too, uh, like we, uh, weedy monocots, uh, same story. We could, couldn't see it, couldn't see gene silencing. So where we're leaving this technology is it works great in dicots. Um, I don't know about everyone we tried, but most everyone we tried, we could see silencing. And what you're looking at is uh, these yellow sectors are silencing of a magnesium chelatase gene, either subunit H or subunit I. In most cases, subunit H is the better one, gives you better visual phenotypes. Tobacco was the ex exception. Uh, subunit I worked a little better, but uh, you know our model plants, uh, Benthamiana, this was our workhorse. We used it for everything, particularly at the end. Rabidopsis, we could see this working. Green amaranth was our model for palmer and water hemp. Tobacco, a couple of crop plants, and then our, of course, our important target weeds. We could see this topical RNAi working, uh, targeting these visual visual marker genes. Um, so with that established, we were really ready to go on our our herbicide, our dis, you know our discovery efforts for RNA based herbicides. So we can silence target genes and glyphosate resistant palmer amaranth and water hemp, you know, lamb's cord or whatever, we, we, we can do it. So it's, it's time to, you know, start the, oh, start the research. But I have one more slide. Um, I threw this one in at the end. Uh, this is the simple version of abrasion. So the, my intention here was to kind of lower the activation energy in case you wanted to try in your favorite dicot plant on your favorite gene just to see what happens with uh, uh, topical RNAi 
this simple abrasion delivery works. I mean, it's it takes a little bit of fiddling with in terms of figuring out how much to abrade, but with those um, parameters that I described earlier, using a 20 tumor, and I have the, I'm not going to go through the steps to save save on some time here, but a templated 20 tumor, chemically synthesized, designed two to four smaller or SI RNAs to that target gene, and use any publicly available tool for SI RNA design. Um, we had one internally, but the extra, there was nothing special, and we didn't we didn't put a lot of time into studying that because what we found was they work. I mean, yeah, there are some differences. You you design four many times, four out of four work, but there's sometimes one would miss for now every now and then, or maybe two out of four worked. But it was easy to find efficacious twenty tumors for uh, the genes that would silence. Now the genes that wouldn't silence, like. EPSPS and polymer amaranth, glyphosate resistant polymer amaranth, or EPSPS in any species. That's a gene that does not silence e easily. And we spent the, we tiled by tiling, uh, you know, just all possible 20 tumors across that gene. It doesn't silence. It's not uh, using this technology. But you design these 20 tumors, you order them using your favorite service provider. So unmodified RNAs, nothing special. And then it's just simple abrasion delivery. So what I'm showing here, you could do it any way you want, but this is just a, you could use a wooden dowel or a piece of PVC pipe. This is 600 grit sandpaper that you get at the hardware store. So the protocol is just pipetting your liquid formulation onto your plants. And you wanna use the emerging true leaves. So in this case, you have your cotyledons, leaf one and two, those work okay, but it's really, those are kind of intermediate, at least in bent. Uh, those are kind of intermediate leaves. The leaf three and four is where you can get really, really robust phenotypes. Pipette your RNA on there, spread it around, and we use a little bit of silhouette or breakthrough to help with the spreading. Let it dry, and then very gently roll the leaves. And you're just trying to do a gentle abrasion on the leaf surface. You're not trying to crush the leaf. Just think about it sort of like you're kind of very gently pressing the, the um, the sandpaper into the epidermis just to give some abrasion, and that does it. Three or five days later, if you're using chelatase H and benthamiana, these leaves will be significantly larger and very yellow. It works as simple as that. So the um, it's relatively cheap. I mean, your cost is in the RNA, and then you know we had a project looking for a different marker gene, and it was in a um, plant species. It was an amaranth. Uh, Hopi red, the still Kerensis, but it's uh, the whole plant's red and it's in amaranth, the red pigment comes from the same red pigment in beets. So the uh, betalane uh, pigment. And we wanted to silence and use that red marker as our visual silence to see if that made a difference. In other words, is it does it behave the same as, um, as uh, chelatase and some of those other visual markers that we had? So from RNA design, to final plant phenotype and conclusions it took us about two weeks. And this is going into, of course, the pathway is mapped out, so that helped us. And we had gene sequence, so that helped us. But using the available, and it was a public gene sequence that we used, in fact, using published pathways, public gene sequence, designing a couple small RNAs, we were able to use this method, this abrasion method, and silence and restore green color to leaves that were red. So it was a, it's a really simple, powerful plant biology method that you can very quickly, um, you know, make valuable conclusions. In this case, uh, we didn't end up using that particular system, but it was still like a, a, an interesting demonstration of, of what, you know, what we were able to do there. Okay. So now, now to the, okay, we're about halfway through. Now to the kind of the herbicide, um, RNA-based herbicides. So kind of describe the progression and let's say that was five years. That's five years of work that you just looked at. Got to the point where we're ready to go and start asking the question, how do we develop RNA-based herbicide? What are the good gene targets? What's, what plant systems does it work in? What we learned, and this is kind of retrospectively, I'm, I'm, I'm making this conclusion, is that 
we identified some great herbicidal gene targets that would produce local necrosis, kill leaves on the plant, but it did not move systemically. So it was, it behaved like a contact herbicide and a contact herbicide that was extremely expensive and not very effective at that. But, you know, in this early stage, that's what it was. It was a contact herbicide. We did not see systemic movement of this, either the applied double strand RNA, and we looked very hard using the most sensitive methods and we could not observe movement in any reliable way of, of our applied molecules from the applied leaves to either roots or the shoots, any, any of the kind of classical places you would look and methods that you would use, it, it doesn't move. Um, so our conclusion was that uh, we needed a more robust whole plant response. In other words, get so good at delivery that we could just deliver RNA to 90% of the cells in the plant and we're good, right? The plant's gonna die. Or we need systemic gene silencing. <clears throat> so fortunately, we did have one model system in which we could apply our double strand RNAs topically and produce systemic gene silencing. And that's in Benthamiana. So, and it's not just any Benthamiana, it's probably a Benthamiana. I'm certain you have it at Texas A&M, uh, the 16C event. So the, the event that everyone uses for GFP expression and vir viral studies, that's the one that we used in Monsanto and in Bayer. And we could apply double strand RNA. And, you know, you see, um, this is our application leaf. It's kind of obscured here at the bottom, but seven to 10 days after we apply our double strand RNA, our 20 tumor, that's important, a 21 mer doesn't do this. But for this particular plant system, you could use longer double strand RNA and get systemic silencing. But anyway, for simplicity's sakes, just use a 20 tumor. That's the best one. But a 20 tumor here, robust local silencing. Seven to 10 days later, you start to see this pattern uh, that's indicative of a silencing signal moving systemically. And I'll show lots of pictures as, as I move throughout this, the rest of this presentation, but this continues, starts at seven to 10 days after application, continues for the life of the plant and continues to spread. So it's amplifying. So I talked about amplification. It's self-sustaining amplified gene silencing that we could uh, initiate with, um, you know, this topical, uh, this, this topical method. Um, and that's what we needed for herbicidal target genes. So going back to that phrase I used, reason to believe, this was our reason to believe that we could do it because we could see it with this trans gene. So we just needed to understand this system well enough and uh, you know, use those learnings to, um, um, sorry, maybe getting dark in here, use those learnings on a, one of our herbicide gene targets. Okay. One key fact that we learned is that, so we can do this systemic silencing with our um, GFP transgene in, in the 16C event, but for the same event, same plants, different target gene, in this case is chelatase subunit I, we don't see systemic silencing. All of our visual marker genes that we could silence and vent behave the same way. In fact, all endogenous genes that we tested, including our herbicidal ones, behave the same way no systemic silencing. You could get very robust local silencing. And we, we even tried um, like spraying. So do applications, let new leaves come out, do applications again. So over time for across two weeks worth of applications. So really loading up the signal um, of local silencing, still nothing. So something very special about this GFP transgene. And it led us to asking the question of, you know, what, what the heck is going on? What's so special about that, uh, this, this particular event? Because what was going on in the background was that we had tried other transgenes and they didn't do this. Um, you know, but this, I mean, these are crop plants and not using viral promoters and that sort of thing. So whatever. But anyway, we had, that, we had those observations that doesn't, even other transgenes don't appear to be behaving this way. But it, it was this paper that was published in 2017 that, uh, really got us to looking at uh, this question of why, you know, why, why, why is 16C doing this um, systemic silencing? And, and what the authors report here is that there was an inadvertent 
integration, and this is a single copy event, but there's a, a partial transpose H gene that's um, integrated immediately adjacent to the GFP expression cassette. So that was an easy one, easy, easy queued up hypothesis. You know, does this, is, is this what's so special about GFP 16C is it has this partial transposase um, and is that what ultimately leads to this very robust systemic silencing of GFP? So we set out to ask that question exper experimentally. Um, one more, one more uh, kind of setup slide here. That was that was hypothesis one. Actually, let me open my window. I'm getting kind of one. Okay, apologies. Um, <clears throat> Okay, that was hypothesis one. Hypothesis two was another observation we had about a secondary small RNAs. So on the left, you're looking at a, a graphic. Now these are sense and anti-sense reads on a log scale. So in the publication for this one, we've used different graphics, but this is easier to see. So I, I just did it this way. So on the left is what we see for GFP. And this is in an application leaf five days after, after um, topical application of double strand RNA. These are what the phenotypes would look like. We would sample the red sectors and send those for small RNA sequencing. So the red bars are our trigger or our double strand RNA. You see three prime transitivity or amplification and also five prime transitivity, which is very strange. This is scarcely even reported in the literature, um, but happens every time for GFP. And one of the uh, one of the advantages of topical double strand RNA is it gives you the cleanest way to silence a gene in a plant. A lot of the methods like VIGS or even, um, you know, just doing traditional transgenes, you have to use expression cassettes and you don't get such clean RNAs like we could produce chemically modified. So these data are the cleanest that are out there in terms of small RNAs. And this is what happens. You get three prime transitivity, and somehow you're getting five prime transitivity too. So in other words, the whole coding region of that gene just gets covered up in small RNAs in just a few days. For other genes like magnesium chelatase, again, this is from the same plant species as in the same experiment, this benthamiana, the chelatase sub, uh, subunit H, a visual phenotype, we sample that. We see three prime transitivity only. So the other question we ask in the paper is, you know, are these, five prime transitive small RNA is predictive of sy systemic silencing. And the backstory here is, as we looked at a lot of different other, trans, uh, other transgenes, uh, or at least other transgenes in other systems, but also endogenous genes, and three prime is what you get. This is a special thing for GFP, and it may have to do with a viral promoter, you'll see later on. But um, anyway, that was our second hypothesis that we looked at is, one, is it the transposase? And two, do these five prime transitive small RNAs have anything to do with it? And how we studied that was essentially recreated the 16C event. Um, so the expression cassettes graphically illustrated on the left. I'm sorry if my camera is wobbling too. This desk that I'm using is like extremely wobbly, so I have to stay away from it. But um, I'm having to touch my computer here, so apologies. It's, there's no earthquake. Um, so recreated the 16C event. So the, the expression cassette is a selectable marker. This is an old fashioned uh, um, you know, transgene. So it's actually uses the same promoter, 35S, a NOS promoter, or terminator, canamycin selection. Again, the 35S and the NOS promoter and then your GFP gene and the T TNPA. So we intentionally made this construct, made new events and we created 10 single copy events that were molecularly like 16C. And then we did, oh, typo, sorry. Then this GFP alone, um, where we did not include the TNPA, so that inadvertent uh, um, integration. On the right here are the expression levels of those single copy events. So uh, at Monsanto, for screening transgenic events, we actually used PCR. Uh, uh, quantitative copy number PCR, and those occasionally miss when you do that. And we did, we missed one. So we had uh, 20 total events, 19 confirmed single copy. We did have one two copy event. And what you're looking at is the expression level. So on the left, 
you have your GFP plus TMPA. On the right, you just have GFP alone, those constructs. And then our one, two copy was just a, a GFP alone. But the take home was that the expression level of all of these events, except for the two copy, we didn't reach 16C. So it's, you know, the best we got was about 72% of the 16C line. So that's one kind of keep that in your mind. 16C is a very high expressing single copy line. And we got there with our two copy, but not any of the other lines. <clears throat> all right, so we have all of, did all the work to make those transgenic events, and then finally time to do the experiment. And we did all of this using carbon dot delivery. Uh, and at that time, that was the state of the art and um, worked great for benthamiana. It's a simple spray over the top of young plants and you get very robust silencing, simple, simple to do. Um, what we observed, uh, you know, from that very first experiment was we're not seeing systemic silencing in any of these events. And when we did see it, I'll, I'll show you a, a picture here, right here. Okay, so on the top where we have no systemic silencing or very weak systemic silencing, it may be hard to see wherever you're sitting, but there's a little bit of banal silencing here. And we saw those in single copy lines. When we saw it, it's usually in one of the four or five reps, whatever we had, and it did not spread. You would see it, and then that's it. It doesn't do anything else. That's in strong contrast to what you see with 16C um, here on the right, or our two copy line. So the two copy line is the only one that did it. And what we're measuring here is the percent silenced area. So the phenotype here is, you know, at day seven or day 14, whenever we're taking down the experiment, we remove all the leaves, place them flat, and we use um, um, photography and then image analysis to quantify the percent area silenced. So GFP or the 16C line still, there was more area silenced, you know, this was probably at day seven, but the two copy clearly did it. It was, it was in every rep and it looked the same, maybe not quite as much, but, Still, the two copy did it. None of the others did though, not in any appreciable way. Okay, uh, from that uh, same series of experiments, we also went in and asked that question about those five prime transit of small RNAs. So it turns out we were able to reproduce that and we reproduced it in all of the events. And so with this graphic, there's a lot going on here. The top is the application leaves. So it's samples taken from leaves we directly applied RNA to. The bottom is systemic leaves. First panel is GFP. Second panel is, I ah, forgot to change these, but this is uh, the GFP plus the transposase. And this is the GFP alone. And this last event number, sorry about that. I didn't change, change my labels here. So it's, this is probably confusing, but this is the two copy line. This is a log scale for uh, counts. So, roughly the same number of small RNAs. There were a little bit more. We quantified all of this in the paper, but 16C, very robust in application leaves, but all the others were too, you know. But importantly, we saw that five prime transitivity. So even in events where we did not see systemic silencing like these, uh, like this particular event here. And then looking up in the, the systemic leaves, maybe a little bit of background read here, but no visual phenotype, and this is, you know, these are counts. This is like 50 small RNAs versus, you know, a one individual up to, you know, a thousand. So it's very low levels of small RNAs, probably above background, but not appreciably so. Our conclusion from this is that these five prime transitives are not predictive of that silencing. Uh, so a further question. So, you know, we had spent all of this time making these events um, you know, there was a lot of convincing of leadership to be able to do this really basic research to understand, understand this observation. And, um, um, and this is where we were at. We couldn't really reproduce it except in the two copy line, but the, that observation in the two copy line led us to another hypothesis and it's around expression level. So I'm showing you the data I showed earlier, which is GFP expression level of seedlings of 16C and then our two copy event. So we wanted to ask the question, it's like, okay, is it the expression level that makes 16C so read it, you know, readily silenced? So what we did was made hemizygous F1 um, lines of 16C. So we used three separate 
you know, independent crosses of 16 seed plus a wild type benthamiana collected the F1 seed and they were all verified as F1. And in fact, oh yeah, this is the expression on the right. So it's rough, you know, these hemizygous lines were roughly 50%. So we reduced it by half. And we had, a, we actually made these for another, another project. And we had thousands of seeds of these F1s of uh, multiple lines. We just picked three to use for this study. So readily available supply of seed and a great way to test this hypothesis around expression level. So we ran the experiment. And what we saw was that when we go into the hemizygous state, we do not observe systemic silencing, or what I keep using this term 16C-like systemic silencing. So on the bottom panel is a picture at the end of, of an experiment where we you know, broke down the, the plants and here's our application leaves. Here is the systemic spread. And again, if you leave this, it just keeps going and going. And it's just, it really uh, overtakes most, and it'll get to the point where there's no more GFP, you know, coming as new leaves come out. But we did not see that same thing. And this is just an example of one line. But here's the silenced area. It was flat. There was no partial silencing nothing, or, or partial systemic. It was clean. So going into the hemizygous state, uh, prevented 16C hemizygous lines from, you know, we did not observe the systemic silencing. Okay, let's uh, have a summary and, and then I'll be finished with a, after I do some acknowledgements. So a um, couple things. So we observe uh, systemic silencing only in this GFP line 16C when we use a 20 tumor. And again, that's kind of for simplicity's sake, because you can do it with a long, uh, of, longer double strand RNA, not a 21 mer, but longer double strand RNAs in this line, just because it's so easy to silence, uh, you can end up getting uh, systemic silencing. Um, but for this case, 20 tumors, we observed that, we wanted to know why. We investigated that bacterial transposase. It did not have an impact on systemic silencing or the expression level of the, uh, of the transgene. So basically did nothing that we could tell. Um, also did not impact those five prime transitive small RNAs. So plus or minus the TNPA, they were there. And this construct, again, they've repeated expression elements in the canamycin gene for selection and then also GFP. So there's a lot going on in that construct that we wouldn't normally do. But uh, so that may have something to do with those five prime transitives, but whatever. That's, it, what, it wasn't correlated with, um, the TNPA was not correlated with the production of five prime transitives, also not uh, indi uh, indicative of systemic silencing. So those, both of our hypotheses were not correct, but we still learned a lot. And we ended up with this hypothesis or uh, the conclusion that there's certainly other factors, but one of those is very high expression. And that, that, that 16C line, and that's, that's one of the important factors for this uh, uh, transgenic uh, systemic silencing of, the, of this transgene. Okay, so I will send this deck and I just put all the publications um, that, that are related to this work. And there's some stuff that we, I didn't have enough time to get into, but the, the thing that I wanna emphasize here is that normally we don't get to publish like this, or if we do, it's a long time after the project, we might get to publish if a product comes out. But in this case, Bear came in and bought Monsanto and made the decision to stop the project. One of the, things the scientists pushed for was to be able to publish because you know there's a lot here and in fact I mean, we did what we could and we could do more but if this is like you know we still have our day jobs and having to put put these out um, but the strategy behind that or the rationale from for leadership is that we want to put this out into the public sector particularly the carbon dots but also knowledge around the 20 tumor and all the the really basic foundational stuff like barriers. You, here they are. You need to address all of those. Use this molecule if you're doing it. Start with this carbon dot. The idea is to let the public sector take it and continue to work on it and, you know, probably need a few more breakthroughs and certainly more time. But, you know, if something comes out in the future, it's, it's, it's we're still interested in this. I'm, I'm not kidding. This comes up every six months in bear. Someone somewhere in the company Besides, they want to do RNAi in plants, and it's like we're all, we're constantly talking them down off of that proposal because it was a business decision, but 
it was also a, a scientific decision. I mean, um, that of course we could have continued to work on it. And we had an excellent team that was very well trained in, in this, uh, doing these types of experiments, but all of those folks have dispersed now and, and they're gone. Uh, only two, two uh, scientists, at least from this list, um, that were working in Woodland anyway, remain in, 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 in Bayer, but most, most have other jobs now, but I um, uh, forget where I was going with that. Anyway. That's the point is putting it out in the public. So, you know, one, it's useful. And two, you know, a, a couple more breakthroughs and we might have like a, you know, a safe, effective RNA, you know, have the potential for safe and effective RNA based herbicides for agriculture. And that's something that we're highly interested in. Um, and just finally the acknowledgements, of course, Monsanto and Bayer, they did all the funding for this. There's so many people that worked on this, more than hundred researchers at its peak. So, all, so much support staff, multiple waves of leadership groups coming through, uh, 10 years of focused effort. And what I listed below, I have the key contributors. And, and the, the three folks in bold are the, are the team that I worked with very closely. And the, everything you saw today with the, you know, the transgenic plants and the systemic silencing, it was, it was basically us four doing, doing that work. And really great group. The whole group was, I mean, we, came, we became very tight because it was kind of like a, a lot of adversity in that project. And, is a hard project because it's a, you're inventing something new and uh, really brought us together and we're functioning very well as, as, a, as a large group. Um, but the decision was made to go a different direction. So that's what most of us did. Okay, that, that's my final slide. I, I talked, I, I figured I was gonna go too long but there's not a lot of times for questions. But again, I, I'll, I'll hang around here. And if you have questions, we can, uh, we can take those out. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Henderson. It's really interesting, and I appreciate you coming here. Uh, we it is almost one, so I know that some of you will have to go, and if you need to do that, by all means, do so. But uh, as Dr. Henderson said, he'll be around for another hour, so if you have questions, we have plenty of time for that. So, Ellen, do we follow the? Typical rule where the first question has to come from a student? Yes, we do. <laughs> I think I see a hand. Let's see, Mason. Hi. Um, I think uh, at the very beginning, you had mentioned that in the early phases of testing the carbon dots, you had observed some phytotoxicity. Um, and I was wondering if you wouldn't mind just spending a little bit more talking about what you observed and how you mitigated that. And uh, yeah. if it was, it was concentration or particle size contingent, I know that you had tested some ranges and stuff. So if you wouldn't mind speaking more about that. Right. So the phytotox <laughs> came from the super spreader. That's what, when I, when I was talking about phytotox, it was the L77. That one was more phytotoxic than the breakthrough. So okay. in the end, we were only using, um, breakthroughs more well -told. It was better tolerated by most plants. But with that being said, transfection reagents absolutely do cause phytotox. Um, and but carbon dots, we're using these at very low concentrations. So that abrasion-based method, I put the detail in there. You're using RNA concentrations of one mg per mil. So very high concentrations, super, super saturating, and you're abrading and probably getting in, you know, a my, you know, a tiny fraction of the RNA. Carbon dots, our concentration was like 10 micrograms per mil. So much, much more effective transfection efficiency wise, also much lower concentration. So those by themselves did not cause um, phytotox, but other transfection reagents, if you're really trying to pump up the RNA uh, concentrations, yeah, you, you see all kinds of problems and it's mainly leaf necrosis and cell death. It's, it's pretty apparent. Okay, great, thank you. <laughs> yep, looks like Kirti. Yeah. yeah, thanks, Alan. Uh, really nice talk, Bill. Uh, enjoyed the presentation. And David, you, and I and Serena talked a couple of months ago. I uh, learned much more now. Um, uh, one question uh, <clears throat> I have is uh, you mentioned that only about 40% of the native genes work, right, in terms of silencing. Are those genes by any chance at very high expression level? 
No, no, it was not correlated to expression level. I, it doesn't hurt to, to have higher expression level, but we had some great genes, very low expression. Um, gave really nice visual phenotypes, some of our herbicide target genes that were low expression. Chelatase is kind of a moderate expressor, um, but of course GFP is like super high. But yeah, there, were, there was no obvious correlation to expression level, but I, I wouldn't rule that out as a, you know, one of the factors. In fact, one of the things we tried was once we had this conclusion of, okay, high, high expression is what causes systemic silencing, at least partially, what are the highest expressed genes in plants? So it's, it's rubisco, right? So we tried rubisco. Unfortunately, that one didn't work. And it's those big gene families where there's a lot of redundancy. There's something about those that make them not as easy to silence. But um, yeah, just trying the highest expressed genes on the block didn't, didn't quite get us there either. Okay. And the other question I had was, in terms of the systemic spread, uh, how long did you follow that following the treatment, initial treatment? Yeah, so standard experiment, seven to 14 days, depending on what we're doing. Um, but for descriptive purposes, we took those all the way to seed because we were curious, does that go to the next generation? And it does not. No, okay. So, that, yeah, that's what I was hoping for. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thanks. <clears throat> I have a <clears throat> very simple question if nobody else is going to pipe up. So you mentioned uh, for the 16C, it, or maybe it was the uh, two copy event that you created, uh, hemizygotes, were those made just by making heterozygotes or did you actually delete them or what? We did just heterozygotes, right? And it was, it was the 16C line and just, yeah, made, made heterozygotes and that's, that was our any zygous source for all of those. Okay, uh, that's that's what I kind of figured, but I just wanted to make sure. Yeah. But Dr. We, Hen we, oh, go ahead. Yeah. Sorry. Um, yeah, just a side comment. We made those hemizygotes to do studies around gene deletion. So mm -hmm. anyway, that's why we made them for like CRISPR type stuff. But we. Uh, it was kind of opportunistic. We had uh, buckets of those of those seeds and so many different lines. So we, we just used them for that study. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Was it Serena? Yes, it was. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, so I wanted to ask when you were working on the systemic silencing in Benthamiana, did you always apply um, like the carbon dots and the surfactant on young true leaves, or did you try it on other locations like on the plant? application yeah no um for routine work four leaf benthamiana so just as leaf three and four true leaves are coming out that's that's the best time generally applying to small leaves is where you get your best phenotypes you can get phenotypes on larger leaves but it just doesn't work as well if you know if i were making a recommendation no matter what plant system in, in you're using is do small seedlings just as those first leaves are starting to emerge mm -hmm. and do your delivery, whether it be abrasion. So if it's abrasion, you have to let it get a little bigger, but even with uh, stomatal flooding and carbon dots, you want them to expand a little bit. So you have air spaces so you can drive into your, you drive your solution into the, into the leaves. So sort of similar to leaf infiltration with that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I have a question too. So you mentioned that it doesn't work very well in monocots and it seems like you have tried. So um, as far as you can tell, what do you think is the reason that there was a, there's this big difference? Yeah. No, I wish I knew. I think we ran out of ideas on, <laughs> on, on why it's not working in monocots. And, you know, frankly, the teams working on monocots were having no success. The teams working on dicots are just like, a party every Friday. So everybody yeah. wants to go to work in the system that worked. And I, I've used, I use that word incremental progress. And that's leadership saw incremental progress in the dicots. There's a market for dicot weed, weed control. So that ultimately that's what 
brought all the monocot folks over to working on dicots, but I really don't have a, uh, an idea because we know RNAi works in corn. And we, that's we use it, so it, it definitely works. Vigs works. Just not sure what wh why. I think we just don't understand enough about the particular mechanism. And I made the statement that I think it's RDR6 based amplification. That could be totally wrong. You know, there could be something peculiar uh, about dicots that's missing in monocots. I, I, we, but short answer is we, did, we don't know. Okay. Well, thank you. So because you found that it doesn't affect monocots for herbicide potential, would you be able to use it in corn perhaps without having to like in or create a resistant corn variety? Yeah, I wish I would have thought of that. That's a great justification, right? It's like, we're working on a selective herbicide for, for dicots for corn. So, right? Yeah, so exactly. <laughs> and I mean, can you think of, if you were going to use it for a, a, a dicot like soybean, what would there be a way to make it selective or how might you go about that? Yeah, you, you do it with sequence. So the, it's, we, you would just design, you know, your target gene and your, your plant, you just design oligos that are not present in the soybean variety. So the selectivity was already baked in, honestly, for dicot versus dicot, and provided the genes were div diverged enough. And uh, in most cases they were. Okay, I have, my name is Sharon Zhang. I have uh, one inch you know, questions. So it looks like your small RNA duplex design is very unique. First of all, you choose the five and the G. Second one is 22 nucleotide. So my question is, and uh, do you have a special reasons to set design the 5G or is it secretary for your company? Oh, uh, yeah, that's a secret. <laughs> <laughs> no, okay. it, that, that was one of the trade secrets, but it, it doesn't matter. You don't have to do that. The five prime yeah. thing is not important. You just make templated 20 tumors. It works beautifully. All, the, all of those other changes were like incremental or changes we had to make for manufacturing. Do you know, do you know which arcanod protein is someone is loaded? Give you five energy with someone. Which argonaut? Uh, we, we did not do pull down, so we don't have any empirical evidence for that. Um, the actually the, on that list of publications. We did do all possible combinations of ends in a, in, a, in a systematic study, and that's reported and it's publishing next week, in fact. And not a, not a lot of big revelations there. The, um, there were some end combinations that work a little better in terms of the phi prime nucleotide. But um, so, so the reason I asked you the question is that generally believe five and the nucleotide were determined the small and the sorting in different arguments. If right. five and have a U, they go into ag one. If you have A, go to ag two. And you give ag you say, go to ag five. But so far, actually, in plants, have another fine any argument contains 5G in the end. So that's surprising to me. I'm just curious. Okay. Yeah, no, I can tell you 5Gs work just fine. So it definitely, there's definitely a mechanism for it in those dicot species. Mm -hmm. um, and again, okay. That paper, it's coming out in plus one. We, we've looked at all the possible end combinations for uh, 20 tumors of uh, targeting GFP and chelatase. And there are some differences that GC clamp, if you flip it around, it doesn't, it like kills the activity because you're loading the scent strand, nothing's happening there. So that, that's, there, there are ways to kill it, but almost all of them work to one degree or another, but some worked a little better. Okay. That seems, let's have more exciting things to study. That's nice, okay. I have another question is that, you use 22 nucleotides, small RNA. Have you checked, or did you absorb, have phase RNA produced, or trans, transacting small RNA produced? Yeah, we studied the TASIs and tried to replicate that in various systems. Um, I mean, that's a real highly specialized example of RNAi where you're having the double cut. So we called it you know, two hit or three hit hypothesis where you're, you're cutting it at multiple places. Uh, with the goal, we were asking the question, does this cause systemic silence? And the answer was no, and it works fine. I mean, it looks about the same as a single. Um, so 
qualitatively silenced area as our metric, no difference. And if you're targeting GFP, you could see that the whole thing is covered in small RNAs. You're targeting chelatase from the slice site all the way to the three prime end. I mean, there's thousands and thousands of small RNAs. So I don't know if they're phased or not. We didn't do that analysis. Interesting. Okay, easy. Thank you. I feel I have a question about your carbon dots delivery. Have you ever think or tried to deliver the, the carbon dots at a flowering stage? So like uh, give a little bit of pressure delivery, so allow the silencing sustain the next generation? No, we, we did not try that. We tried uh, seed delivery with carbon dots. In other words, imbibing the seeds in that solution to see what happened. So kind of like a pre-emergence concept. And we also tried root delivery. So using hydroponics, like benthamiana, tiny plants, just growing them in vats of RNA, which are the carbon dot complex. And neither of those worked. So I don't know. And that was using GFP as our readout, which is highly sensitive. So it's easy to silence gene. And we did not see silencing using those alternative methods. So, but did not look at flowers. Not, sh not sure, maybe. Okay. Thank you. Good. I have a, a question, Bill. Would how would you characterize the uh, carbon dot approach um, as a tool in comparison to, let's say, Vig's type of RNAi? So yeah. Just as a discussion point and thought. You know, if you're trying to strategize experiments, yeah. how would you kind of size them up? Um, well, so what, one comparison, you could think about the amount of effort that you need to, to do one versus the other. So carbon dots, yes, you have to produce those chemically I mean, or produce those in-house. We describe how to do it in the paper mm -hmm. and it, it's basically a microwave it. It's, I mean, there's more technical terms, but this branch PEI, and we have all the conditions described. Microwave it with a microwave synthesizer, a very specialized instrument, but uh, clean those up using gel filtration, collect the particular fraction, and then you have enough for six months. So you do that once and you get lots. Uh, but the other method was the glucose uh, carbon core carbon dot. It was a little bit easier to make. You don't have to have such specialized equipment, but Provided you have carbon carbon dots, I mean, you're ready to go as soon as your RNA arrives, right? Your plants are there, your RNA is there, and you go. And you have phenotypes in five days. So that's one thing with VIGS is you have to do construct building and then get everything into agro. And then, or if you're using agro, you may not, may not be, but let's just say you are using agro is, um, you know, get all those cultures going and do your infiltrations. But so time-wise, quicker with the topical method, especially abrasion. And if I were doing qualitative uh, kind of um, questions about a particular gene target, I would just do abrasion. I mean, it's so easy with the sandpaper or another way to do it is take a Q-tip with that silicone carbide 360 grit. You just dip the Q-tip in it and you very gently roll it. And that's all it takes. Wow. So that, that way is very, very quick. Um, and that's great for like screening yes, no on oligos. So do a quick experiment, screen several, get some that work, and then you can you know, do more qual uh, quantitative methods. So time. The other piece is this idea of clean, you know, a clean 20 tumor or a clean 20 former or a clean 21 mer. You know, VIGs, you have to have a minimum size. And we did use a lot of VIGs. That was our workhorse. But let's say below 60 base pairs, it's hard to get good expression from it from a construct. So you're limited in size. So you're looking at larger, um, you know, larger slight, you know, kind of silencing signal. That's so it kind of takes up real estate on your gene. If you're trying to ask a question about, I don't know, gene structure or something like that. I mean, that 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 might be a disadvantage. But if you're trying to ask specific questions about molecular mechanism around RNAi, this tool is the way to go because it's the only method that gives you such clean readouts 
And that's not, we, we didn't have that in plants because everything is using expression constructs and that sort of thing that, that don't give you this really clean readout um, where, um, but VIGS is a great tool and then it goes systemic. So, right. so if, you, if you need your gene to go systemic, use VIGS. Yeah. Cool. Very exciting. So Bill, a couple more questions. <clears throat> Uh, the slide that you showed with various dicot species, I don't think I saw cotton there. Have you done anything on cotton? Uh, not with them. Um, no, the short answer is no. We, we did early, but not with any of the methods that actually work. So my guess is it would work on cotton. I mean, that's, you get a sense for the, the type of leaves and things that, that, that this works for. And I think it would work great on cotton personally, but I didn't try it. Okay. And uh, you, um, you said that in the amaranth species, the EPSPS knockout or did not work, right? Did anything else work in that species? Yeah, no, uh, chelatase worked, chelatase subunit H that was on that slide very robust silencing of that gene. It had a few others that we could, including our herbicide target genes, the ones that we discovered, we could silence those in, in Palmer. Glyphosate resistant Palmer amaranth, this crazy plant, worked just like all the other amaranths, but not EPSPS. And in fact, EPSPS in any species, we couldn't see uh, knockdown. So it was one of those 60% of genes that just don't silence using this method. Okay. <clears throat> I don't know too much about single-stranded RNA. Does that not work at all? Uh, I wouldn't say, I mean, no. <laughs> I, no, it doesn't. We, we tried in lots of different forms. Um, I mean, the only caveat is like, if you're doing protoplast, maybe you can get it to work the, the, with the same caveat that I talked about blunt-ended 20 tumors. Mm -hmm. If you really pump up the concentration, you might get a little bit of knockdown, but generally no. Uh, um, 20 tumors is the way to go. It's the best one. And that's after a lot of work looking at all, all sorts of types of RNAs. Okay. Well, uh, Dr. Hendricks, I have to leave the meeting now, so I'm going to stop the recording and uh, I'll make you the host so that y'all can continue whatever discussion you want to have, but I just wanted to thank you again for meeting okay. with us. I know it's getting to be late at night for you and we really appreciate you coming yeah. and sticking around. All right, thank you. Yeah, it even looks dark over there. Yeah, let me turn on the light. It's actually not that dark. <laughs> it's, it's